Well, hello, my name's Gordon Palmer. Some of you might remember me from the time before I was on uh, holiday. Um, minister here at Clement Parish Church and delighted to be here and to be leading the service for Sunday, July the 11th. As well as myself taking part in this service, Miriam Murphy will be doing the Bible reading. Karen Palmer will be leading us in our prayers for others. And it's Anna Weir who's doing the signing this Sunday. The psalmist says, I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. Let us join the psalmist in proclaiming the faithfulness of a great and a mighty God, immortal, invisible, God only wise. We're going to join together in prayer and our, <clears throat> after our prayers of approach and confession, we have gathered up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer, the form of that prayer that we use. Words for that will be on the screen. Let us pray. Lord God, we come to worship and adore you. We come at this particular place, this particular moment of time, and come to give you praise for everything and praise forever. You're a God without beginning, without end, a God who is everywhere, a God who is eternal. And your love also is something without beginning and end. Your love is eternal. Your love is perfect. Your love is pure. So too, gracious God, is your faithfulness. You're never caught off guard. You never forget what you've said you would do. But you're one who we can be 
sure of, one we can depend on. You have no competitor, no rival, no substitute. And you are right, and you are just. Your plans for us are good. You long for the best for us. Well, we cannot fully understand. We can't get our heads around how big is your love, how great is your love, and, and why you love. But your word declares that that's what you're like. And when Jesus came on earth as one of us, he showed us that's what you're like. And in Jesus, we see enough to satisfy us forever. And yet, Lord God, there are things on earth which contradict all of that. We do not see your will always being done on earth. And there are times, we admit, when we ourselves have failed to do your will. We have failed you by what we have done or by what we've omitted to do. We have sinned and we have been sinned against. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy on our family. Have mercy on our friends. Have mercy on those we think of, dif think of as different or other. Have mercy on those we consider enemies. And all for your glory. Lord God, our time on earth is fairly short and your purpose is long. Guide us in our time to fulfill your purposes. Guide us in what lies ahead this coming week. Help us in the things that challenge us. Keep us faithful. Grant us wisdom. Grant us humility. And may we know you with us through the presence of your Holy Spirit, helping and enabling us to follow the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. And in whose words we gather up our prayers. Our Father in heaven. The reading today comes from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, all the way to chapter 3, verse 13. In my thirtieth year, in the fourth month of the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kiba River, the heavens opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest the son of Buzi, by the Kiba River in the land of the Babylonians. There the hand of the Lord was on him. And now what follows in the next 28 verses is the vision Ezekiel sees of the Lord of all hosts seated on the throne and the cherubim. We continue on chapter 1 verse 28. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. He said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet, and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said, Son of man, I am sending you the Israelites to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, 
Do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you and you living live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say or be terrified by them, though they are a rebellious people. You must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like the rebellious people. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Then I looked and I saw a hand stretched out to me. In it was a scroll which he unrolled before me. On both sides it were written words of lament and mourning and foe and woe. And he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you, eat this scroll, then go and speak to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. He then said to me, Son of man, go now to the people of Israel and speak my words to them. You are not being sent to a people of obscure speech and strange language, but to the people of Israel. Not to many peoples of obscure speech and strange language whose words you cannot understand. Surely, if I had sent you to them, they would have listened to you. But the people of Israel are not willing to listen to you because they are not willing to listen to me. For all the Israelites are hardened and obstinate. But I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are. I will make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious people. And he said to me, Son of man, listen carefully and take to heart all the words I speak to you. Go now to your people in exile and speak to them. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, whether they listen or fail to listen. Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a loud rumbling sound as the glory of the Lord rose from the place where it was standing. It was the sound of wings of the living creatures brushing against each other, and the sound of the wheels beside them, a loud rumbling sound. This is the word of the Lord. It was some vision that Ezekiel saw. We didn't read through all the details of it in verses 4 to 27. But it was a picture of, of a great God, a mighty God. Although the song, our God is a great big God, has got a light tune, although it um, seems very bouncy and happy, it's saying something very big and something very serious. And just like Ezekiel, the, the words in our God is a great big God are words that are stretching to, to try to convey something of the majesty and the greatness. Therefore, before we come to look at that um, passage in Ezekiel, let us sing, Our God is a Great Big God.
Is there a birthday that you especially remember, one that stands out from all the birthdays in the past, maybe where something special happened or where something disastrous happened or whatever? Or maybe, like me, your, your past birthdays just kind of tend to, to merge into one. You know, I find it difficult to separate out what happened in the 37 birthdays up until now. I can hear you scoffing. Stop it. Well, I don't know how old Ezekiel was when he, when he died, but one thing I'm sure of is that he remembered his 30th birthday. It started badly. The day started, he was in Babylon, and he didn't want to be there. Ezekiel was a Jew. He, he'd been brought up in Jerusalem. He'd been brought up by a father who was one of the priests that looked after the temple and, and the holy city. And the responsibility, the privilege of being a priest was something passed from father to son. And so, from Ezekiel's um, youngest days, he was earmarked as someone who one day was going to be a, a priest in the Lord's temple. It was a position of great responsibility, of great privilege. And his young years were all shaped towards fulfilling that great destiny. The law was that you could become a priest, that you actually took part in being the priest when you reached the age of 30. But five years before Ezekiel got there, an army from Babylon came and captured Jerusalem. The Babylonians didn't destroy Jerusalem, at least not that time, but they, they took the, the creme de la creme, they took the leaders of Jerusalem with them back into exile. You know, the folks that had the most followers on Instagram or the most tweets or whatever, the people who were really influential, the people who were important in the Jewish society were, were taken off to Babylon. That way, the Babylonians thought they would be able to make Jerusalem more subservient and and so on. And one of those taken off into exile in Bab Babylon was Ezekiel. And so on the day when he should have been becoming a priest in the temple of the Lord, there he was, five years' experience of being a refugee. Now, in this time of pandemic that we've been through, we've seen something of, of the dislocation that people suffer people who once had a job and the job was no longer there, people who maybe were pilots and then the airline's not flying, so they have to go off and find somebody else, people who are artists and musicians who have nowhere to perform, no theatres where there's a stage, and so on and so on. We've seen people dislocated from homes, losing their job, they can't afford the rent, they have to go back and stay with parents, or people who, who feel that they should go and back to parents to look after elderly relatives, or people who have stayed in caravans or the garden shed so that they're not going into the house and risk taking the COVID into the household when they're day to day going to their work in the care home or wherever. And these dislocations are, of course, sore. They're, they're, they're painful. They're costly. But much more was what Ezekiel was going through. Suppose a foreign power came and conquered us, took us to a land where we'd never been before, a culture we were completely unfamiliar with, a, a language we knew nothing of, a place where, yes, there was great wealth, but we were getting none of it. We were, as it were, living in corrugated tin sheds, while up the hill there was a, a mansion and people coming and going with all kinds of great wealth. That's what was happening for Ezekiel. And more than that, more than just the dislocation, more than just the hopelessness of being a refugee for all these years, the, the very foundation stones of the identity of the people of Israel were being removed. They were God's chosen people, and that was based on their being a, a redeemed people, a people taken out of slavery in the foreign land of Egypt, people who were promised and then taken into the promised land, people who were looking after the temple of the Lord, the house of God on earth, and these foundation stones were removed. They were back in a foreign land, back in slavery. They were not in the promised land. And they didn't have the temple. And, and so, are we the chosen people of God or not? The whole, the whole identity, the things that marked them out, the land promised to Abraham and his descendants, the throne city of David, the temple of the invincible God, all removed. 
And so everything that they believed, everything they thought they understood was suddenly called into question. They could no longer despise other people or other religions as if inferior. And the days when being a priest meant something were long gone. The days when you could only get on if you were a faithful Jew had disappeared. In fact, these things were a disadvantage now. So, happy birthday, Ezekiel. That's his experience. That's where he started from that morning as he got up. Nobody's going to bring him cake, no cards to open, no presents. Nobody's going to come along and sing happy birthday to you. In fact, if there was any singing going on around Ezekiel, it might well have been in the words of Psalm 137, verse 1, by the waters of Babylon, we lay down and wept. We wept when we remembered thee, Zion. And then, then he received a vision from God. That's what made this day different from every other day in the last five years. It was an amazing and unusual and extraordinary vision. Now, in the Claremont Calling that we put out on Friday, there is a description of what Ezekiel saw, which is recorded in verses 4 to 28. It's from the Bible Project, and they have a lot of good and useful introductions to Bible books, Bible characters, Bible themes. And from Claremont Calling and the website that's there for the Bible Project, you'll be able to see other things that they have. And there, in Clement Calling, you, we see their very good summary of Ezekiel, or the first half of the book of Ezekiel. Now, we need not get bogged down with all the detail of the vision in verses 4 to 28. We should notice the repetition of words like appearance and, and likeness. That is, Ezekiel wasn't so in concern to give us everything in great factual detail, he was painting with broad strokes. And he, he concludes by saying, verse 28 of chapter 1, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. Not just, here's God, I can tell you what he looks like. One removed from that, it was the glory of the Lord. But no, not just the glory of the Lord, it was the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And even further back, it was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. He's not telling us what God looks like. He, he knows fine well he's trying to describe the indescribable, explain the inexplicable. And we cannot share in the vision that he saw. We can only read the description, very well aware of the limitation of words that don't do justice to the amazing power of the experience itself. And the combination of the things in the vision, the storm in verse 4, the creatures, verses 5 to 14, the wheels, verses 15 to 24, and the throne and the final verses, they, they suggest something of the glorious presence and power of God. And significantly, the wheels were saying to Ezekiel, the Lord is not confined to the temple in Jerusalem. He's not back there. The Lord is here in Babylon. He's here in all his glory and fullness. The Lord has not abandoned his people. They are not out of reach. His glory and his power do not fade over distance. They're not like some radio signal that can only go so far. Even Babylon can become a place of hope and of transformation. So the vision in chapter 1 shouldn't have us asking about what all the little details mean. What it should make us think about is whether our God is too small. Because that's what had happened to Ezekiel. Surrounded by the day-to-day -day life of being in exile, of being a refugee, God seemed distant, God seemed far away, God seemed unable, God seemed powerless. And maybe for us, too, our experience of the Lord has become too faint and, and too weak. I think it's a trouble with much of Christianity today that we've too feeble a perception of the glory of the Lord. The Almighty has become the Almighty, to borrow a phrase from George MacLeod. Now, of course, we cannot conjure up particular experiences like this, it's God who gives. It's God who is active here. We're told in verse 3, the heavens were opened, suggesting just there, like 
It was when Jesus was baptized. The heavens then were opened and the Lord spoke. Here is God revealing and God gives his word. God gives his spirit. The hand of the Lord comes upon Ezekiel and it's the Lord who sends them. But though we cannot dictate to God the when and how, of he, how he should make himself known, we should be very aware that we need to realize and experience his glory, that we need to know his greatness. And that's especially so in the hard times that God's people go through in Ezekiel's day and for the church in the Western world today. A response to where we find ourselves is not just about whether we can come up with the right ideas or the right programs. These things matter. But more important is the presence of a great God, a glorious God, a God of majesty and of worthiness, a God like that who is with us and among us. And even if we are not to be privileged to the kind of overwhelming vision that Ezekiel experienced. We should be a people who long, who pray for deeper experience of the greatness of God in our lives. Now, looking for that taste of the greatness, the goodness of God, is not to advocate an experience that's removed from real life and real living. The details given in, in verses 1 to 3 of the first chapter are very, very specific, very detailed. And the word there in verse 3 is very emphatic. There the hand of the Lord was on him, on Ezekiel. The word there underlines the contrast between what Ezekiel is about to see and all else that was around him as he turned 30. Miles from Zion, in exile, away from the temple, under the yoke of foreign rule, there, in all of that, there, in all of that, the Lord appeared to Ezekiel. And where the Lord seemed to be absent and where his people seemed to be totally rejected was transformed now by this divine invasion. Now, I suppose we're used to thinking of God being God who is everywhere. We can pray at the bus stop. We can pray in the bus because God is everywhere. We can pray in the, when we're in the bath. We can pray when we're driving the car, um, although don't do it with your eyes closed. God is everywhere. But that was only a faint idea um, amongst the Jewish people at this time. Particularly, they thought of him in the temple, in Jerusalem, in the holy city. And the exile experience removed that and, and made them feel that God had abandoned them. And Ezekiel had been wrestling with that. It was all over. He'd been defeated. It's a bit like when, when Murray is, loses at Wimbledon. It, it, it's over. Okay, there might be a tournament going on, but he's no part in it. It's finished. Or when Scotland got the Euros. That's it. Said, it's over for and Ezekiel had that kind of feeling, it's all over, it's finished, we've been beaten. God's been whipped. That's why we're in exile here. And then, suddenly, on his 30th birthday, God is there, God is with them. No border guards can turn him away or keep him out. Nowhere is barred to the throne chariot of this God, this great God there. Verse 3, the hand of the Lord was on Ezekiel. Now, visions like this, religious high points and experiences of God, are not just so that we can simply lap them up and enjoy them, have our religious batteries charged. Ezekiel is grasped by the Spirit of God, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2. Twice in verses 3 and 4 of that chapter, the Lord says, I am sending you. You see, with the vision came the call to serve. He is to be God's spokesman. He is to be God's agent. God has work for him to do. And to be God's spokesman, to be God's agent in the world, he and we too have to take the word of God seriously. And so there is this vision of him being given a scroll on both sides of it were written words from God, and he's told to eat the scroll. Take the word of God. May the word of God become part of you. 
And just as much as our bodies need food for physical living, so too our soul needs a word from the Lord, our spirit needs a word from the Lord that we might live, that we might be fed, that we might be nurtured. And so it's not enough just to have a cursory familiarity with the story of Scripture. It's vital to life itself. Is that the kind of seriousness with which you take the Word of God and the Scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments? Does it matter as much as getting our breakfast, having lunch, having dinner? Or is the soul not as important as the spiritual life not as important as our physical lives? And then there is words given to Ezekiel when he's told that being faithful to God's call doesn't mean that all, everything's going to go easily. Ezekiel, you're not going to be appreciated. People are, verse 7 of chapter 3, hardened and obstinate. I remember um, adverts many years ago on, on television about, you know, join the Navy and see the world. They didn't mention the tough training. They didn't mention the possibility of war. But there it was. You want to see the world? Join the Navy. See the world. Well, Ezekiel doesn't get an enticement like that. Look at verses 6 and 7 of chapter 2. Become a prophet and be hated. Sit on scorpions. Get covered in briars. Nor actually do we get... <clears throat> any different treatment from Jesus when He challenges us to follow. Yes, there are the promises that He will be with us, but basic to His call is the command that each day we have to pick up our cross daily. Now, I want to underline four things um, in conclusion. <clears throat> One, the key issue in our lives and witness as Christians is a genuine living experience of God. It's about knowing God. Not knowing about God, but knowing Him. This is what gives the church credibility. This is what gives ministry and service credibility that we are in fellowship with the living God. That's what qualifies us to speak for Him, to, to, to represent Him, to be His agents in the world. I'm a different view from many of my colleagues. I've always had strong views that on church notice boards, you know, the minister's name shouldn't be followed by the degrees, the letter after his or her name. You know, because ultimately what, what qualifies someone for ministry is not that they've got a theology degree, not that they've studied um, church law. I, even I passed a church law exam once. That, that, that's not what qualifies us. What qualifies us is that we're called by God. What qualifies us is that we've met with a living God and heard his call and responded to that. And the flip side of that is it doesn't matter then if you haven't been to Bible college. It doesn't matter if you haven't got a degree. It doesn't matter if you haven't passed any exams in church law. If you know God, then you are his people, his agents, his representatives, his ambassadors in the world. The key thing is that we know God. Taste him. Experience him. Secondly, <clears throat> Notice that it's both being led by the Spirit of God and following the Word of God that are part and parcel of being God's people. Ezekiel has the Spirit come upon him and into him, verse 2. And then he's given in this picture of the scroll the, the Word of God to say, this is to be your guidance. And we need both. And as receiving both the Spirit and the Word, the response then is to obey. And that's what set Ezekiel apart. He was going to rebellious and a disobedient people. But to do that, specific, deliberate acts of obedience are needed. That's the fruit of taking the Word of God seriously. In our experience-saturated society, where rules are so often shoved aside, and what you feel is what matters, the church has been too readily, too easily influenced by that. It's not just about our feelings. The Word of God, ministered through the Spirit of God, and the obedience to the Spirit and the obedience to the Word are crucial. 
Thirdly, the church today, amazingly enough, finds itself in a similar position to Ezekiel. Oh yeah, of course, we're not in Babylon, we're not in a foreign country. Ezekiel lived two and a half thousand years ago, but there are great similarities. There's been recent debate, I got it in a magazine I got just last week, about whether Christians in the UK today are being persecuted. Well, I think that's a bit strong, actually, but I see where the point's coming from. Respect has gone, privilege has been substantially removed. Christianity is often mocked and caricatured. Street preachers have been arrested. Public figures have been called into question about their particular views and faith. Tim Farron was hounded out of his position as leader of the Liberal Party. And there's been similar knives drawn for Kate Forbes of the SMP. And just as Ezekiel could look back on a time when his faith seemed to have status and significance in the world. So too, it's not that long since the church in the West had a similar place. And that's gone. There is no point in expecting it to be handed back to us. It's not going to be. And I'm not even sure that it would be a good thing to have it back, actually. For just as Ezekiel had to rethink his faith, rethink what obedience would mean, Rethink what it would mean to serve God when the tide was flowing the other way. So too, in our day and age, does a once cozy, once national, and once nominal church have enormous lessons to learn. How do we, in the words of verse 4 of Psalm 137, sing the Lord's song in a strange land? That's the call and the challenge for us. Not to rest and rely on what used to be, what might have been. Not expecting the tide to turn so that suddenly everyone's going to be much more respectful and everything else. The challenge is the, the questions are not going to go away. And so the church has to ask itself, how do we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? But fourthly, lastly, God is here. The task is challenging. Obedience is not easy. Going against the culture of the time is not child's play. Taking the Word of God seriously, following the Spirit of Jesus, the same Spirit who led Jesus to Calvary, is not a picnic. But God is here. He's not tied to one place. He's not tied to one time. He's not tied to particular or special buildings. He's not tied to particular religious ritual. This is what Ezekiel was being shown. You see, he thought it was, it was the other way. He thought God was tied to one place, one time to special buildings and rituals. And, and he didn't have them, so he was lost. But suddenly here God comes and says, it's not about any of those things. The living God lives all over the world and lives in his fullness all over the world. And the God who is here is a glorious God. He simply needs more Ezekiel types to work with and to work through in the world. A people who know God, who are led by his spirit, a people devoted to his words, a people who will obey sacrificially, a people who will learn and, and, and take the challenge. What does it mean to sing the Lord's song in a state, strange land? How do we be faithful to God when we're in the minority, when we're in exile? And that can be you. We don't, as I said, need BDs or courses and this and that. Simply to trust God to fear in him, a great God, who has a great purpose and a great cause, and who is worth following through the scorpions and the briars and whatever else that means for us today. And following that God, following such a God, by the way, as an invitation to have an eternity of happy birthdays. Let us pray. Help us know, help us understand, gracious God, that just as you were Ezekiel's sufficiency and 
his exile in Babylon, just as you were able to reach out and touch his life, so you are with us wherever we are. And so you call us to live with you, to live for you. Lord, help us. Help us to sing your song in our strange land. Help us to say, Jesus Christ has risen. Jesus Christ is coming again. Jesus Christ is worth it. And give us the wisdom and the grace that we need to live out the way of Jesus. For your glory. Amen. Well, the Spirit of God coming upon Ezekiel was a big deal, a huge deal. And that same Spirit of God is still around and still at work in the world today. And so we sing, and it's a short hymn, so we'll sing it through a couple of times, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. And it's not just words, it's not just tune, it's prayer. Lord, might we know you more, might we love you better. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. After we've sung this, we'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, and then Karen Palmer will be leading us in our prayers for others. I believe in God the Father, the prayer for others today we're not going to close our eyes we're going to keep them open and look around our houses and find things there that remind us to pray for other people so let's pray let's talk to God Father God of great glory full of kindness and compassion we bring others to you today We look at our face masks and our sanitizer, and we remember our hospitals, overstretched, tired staff, terribly ill people, bereaved relatives, and we pray for them. We pray for the staff, pray that they would um, have all the equipment they need. We pray that you would strengthen them when they're tired and encourage them. We pray that you'd give them wisdom as they look after their patients. 
And we pray for countries who don't have the same resources as us. We pray for countries struggling with the medical care of their people, countries that haven't had access yet to vaccines, countries that can't transport the vaccines or make sure they get to the most vulnerable people. We pray for countries where the leaders are indifferent to the suffering of their people. We pray for North Korea refusing offers of vaccines whose people are starving. Father, we pray that you would open the eyes of those with responsibility and give them compassion. Father, we look around our houses and perhaps we see an empty chair. And we pray for all those who are bereaved, all those who look at a chair in their house where someone should be sitting. We pray that they would know your comfort and your care. Father, we look at the comforts we have in our houses. We look at comfy beds, cushions, covers, and we pray for all those who are homeless. We think of the homeless people in our country, again, more vulnerable to COVID and disease. We pray for the organisations working with them. We pray for Glasgow City Mission, for Bethany Christian Trust, for all those who care and we pray that they would be able to communicate your love to the people that they serve. We pray that you'd help us be generous to these organisations and to support them in their work. Father, we open our fridges full of food and we think of those who are unsure of where their next meal will come from, who are limited in what they can buy who have children and family that they don't know how they're going to feed. We pray for our food bank volunteers and organisers. We pray for the people that use them. We pray that you would be seen to be present in these places. We pray that you would supply the needs of the people that, who need them. We pray for um, organisations working with um, those in countries where food is scarce. We pray that you would help them find the resources they need. Father, if we have children's toys in our homes, we look at them and remember all the people suffering from the loss of a child. Those who have suffered miscarriage, those who have lost children through other circumstances. Father, be their comfort. May they, may they know your care, may they know your practical support shown by other people caring for them. May they know your love. Father, we look at our clocks and we think of those who are waiting. Those who are waiting for appointments. Those who are waiting for surgery, which has perhaps been cancelled yet again those who are waiting for news, desperately wanting to know what's happened to a loved one. Please be their comfort. Please help them be aware of your presence with them. And please be with them in their waiting. Father, we watch our television and though we may despair of how parochial our news is, we pray for our world. We use what we see, the headlines, to bring these people before you. We pray for your church in other countries where your church might be persecuted. We pray that your persecuted church would know your presence and would know the strength that you can give them. Father, we look out our windows and we pray for our community. We pray for our neighbours. We pray that you would help us to be good neighbours. We pray that our neighbours would see you in us. We pray for um, Miriam as she leads our holiday club later this month. We pray for Miriam and her team as they bring the good news of Jesus to the children. We pray that good relationships would be made with the children and with their families. We pray for our church. 
We pray that you would guide us in these days to come, that you would give us wisdom in how we be your church in a world that is still suffering with COVID. We pray that you would give our Minister Gordon and his team and the Kirk Session wisdom in knowing how to proceed. Please guide their discussions. Please give them great creativity and vision over what can be possible. Please excite us with the possibilities ahead. Please help us to work together to bring your love to the people that we live with. Father, we look at lamps or lights in our house and we think of people who feel as if they're in darkness, who feel trapped, who have no joy, who have no light, who don't know where they're going. Father, we do. We, we know where we're going. We have you. We have the hope of of being with you for all eternity that has come to us through Jesus. We have joy without ceasing, knowing that you love us and knowing that you're with us. Help us to share your light, to share your hope, to share your joy, to share your joy with others. Help us not to keep the light to ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, thanks for joining with us for our service. Um, before we sing our closing praise, just to underline, as I was uh, mentioning in, in the sermon, that there is a claimant calling which um, takes more time to explore some of the background to Ezekiel. Um, but also, I want to say that Ezekiel is a big book, 49, is it? 48 chapters. I should have looked at that first, shouldn't I? 48 chapters. Ezekiel is a big book. There's a lot to it and a lot about it that's very different, very unusual and very strange. And we're not going to be able to cover everything just um, um, in a series of Sunday morning sermons. So we're bringing back the Taking It Further, um, which was a, um, <clears throat> an open discussion invitation that we, we had for Tuesday evenings. It's going to start again this coming Tuesday. Um, it's going to be... Uh, just from seven o'clock until eight or so. Um, no need to register or anything, just simply you're welcome to turn up. You can join us either um, over the internet or by telephone. Um, and if you need details about that, the links are on the screen here for those of you who are watching. And if you need a reminder of the telephone, if you contact the church office on, on Monday or Tuesday, then Leslie will be able to let you know the um, <clears throat> the phone number you can use to join us. So either by telephone or online, we welcome just to come and, and join us as we try to tease out a bit further what's going on in this extraordinary stuff that Ezekiel goes through and how much can we learn from him in his ministry about how we can sing the Lord's song in a strange land. So Tuesday evenings, starting this coming Tuesday, um, which must be July the 13th um, at, at 7 o'clock, and as I say, the link's below. Closing praise, I the Lord of sea and sky. And after we've sung this, there's the words of the grace in which we can bless one another. God bless you.